everyone. I hope you are all doing well. I miss you so much. I really can't wait for all of this to hopefully be over soon so that I can see you again. Today we're going to work with a few chapters of To Kill a Mockingbird and hopefully you've read the first three chapters and you have a good understanding of how the story began. There are a lot of characters that were introduced in these first three chapters. We have our narrator Scout and her brother Jem, their friend Dill, Scout and Jem's father Atticus, and their cook Calpurnia. And then you also have some other important characters like the infamous Boo Radley and Miss Maudie. So I want to talk to you about all of those characters as they will continue to develop as we progress throughout the story. Today, as I told you earlier on in the week, we're going to read the abridged version of a few chapters. So together, in this video, I'm going to read the abridged or the shortened version of chapter 4, of chapter 5, and of chapter 6. For homework, you're going to read the full text of chapter 7, and then the abridged versions of chapters 8 and 9. So we're going to alternate back and forth um, between these two different versions, one for the sake of time, and two so that we can discuss really the most important parts of the chapters together. So uh, the aim for Tuesday was on characterizing and um, identifying the, the characteristics of the setting of Maycomb County, but I really hope that you were also able to realize that although the setting in general is Maycomb County, a lot of the events take place outside. Both Scout, Jem, and then their friend Dill play a lot outside. And although that's really not what we were seeing in the past, um, except obviously for this quarantine time that we're in, um, this is what kids did during the summer. They were just outside, they played make-believe games, and um, kind of looked forward to, uh, to coming up with these new games all of the time. So today what I would like us to do is to focus on the conflict. The conflict that uh, it is going to begin to develop in these chapters is also going to lead us to some of the themes, um, the, the message that Harper Lee is trying to, to get across. And so they're really going to parallel one another. So in the first few chapters, you saw that Jem, Dill, and Scout are fascinated by the mystery of Boo Radley, and they come up with this game. And this game really is the catalyst to the conflict in the story. So I wish we can discuss in length Boo Radley, um, but very briefly, what I would like to, to say is I need everyone to make sure they understand where Scout and her brother get all of the information about Boo Radley from. Is it hearsay? Is it just these rumors that other kids um, project around town? Are the adults the ones who are giving them this information? And also think about what led to Boo Radley's permanent imprisonment inside of his home. He was just a young teenager um, at one point, and then all of a sudden he was never seen again. There's a lot of mystery that it involves the, the Radley family, but it's very significant that the children have never seen Boo Radley. So I want us to make sure we can answer that. To do that, you should really look back at the first three chapters, and then I'll point out some information that we get in chapter four as well. So let's take a look at the abridged version of chapter four. And, um, you know, I'll stop at a couple of points to discuss some of the important things. So it says, my school year went on pretty uneventfully. One day while walking home, I ran past the Radley's house as I normally do. This time, however, something caught my eye. I took a deep breath, turned around, and went back. Next to the Radley house, there were two tall oak trees. One of the trees had a knot hole, and there was some shiny tin foil sticking out of it. I stuck my hand in the knot hole and pulled out two pieces of chewing gum, Wrigley's Double Mint. I quickly snatched it up and ran home, even though I wanted to cram it into my mouth. Once I got to the porch, I inspected my find. 
I sniffed and licked it, and when I didn't die, I put the gum in my mouth. Jem came home and wondered where I got the gum. I finally told him that I found it in the Radley's tree. Jem yelled, spit it out right now. Don't you know you're not supposed to even touch the trees over there? You'll get, your, you'll get killed if you do. And I obeyed. So I'm going to highlight something important here. And it's the two pieces of chewing gum that, um, that Scout finds. Okay. And I'll tell you why I'm highlighting this in a little bit. So let's continue on. Summer was on the way, which was our favorite season. It also meant that Dill was on the way. On the last day of school, we were let out early. As Jem and I walked past the Bradley's oak trees, I saw shiny tinfoil again in the knothole. We both ran over, grabbed the prize, and hurried home to examine it. It was a small jewelry box covered in tinfoil wrappers. Inside the box were two Indian head pennies that were really old. Since this was pretty special, I began to think that this knothole might be someone's special hiding place. We tried to think of who walked that way and who might be using this as their hiding spot. We didn't know if we should keep them or put them back. Jem suggested that they keep them until school starts and then ask everyone if it's theirs. I noticed Jem looking back at the Radley's house for a long time and seemed to be real thoughtful. So I want to highlight the next item that the children find. Inside the box were these two Indian head pennies that were really old. Dill finally arrives. Miss Rachel picks him up and we meet up with him a little later. Dill suggests picking up where we left off, play acting. But I'm tired of those. I thought it would be fun to roll in the tire. I'm first, I announced. I folded myself in the tire and Jem pushed me hard down the sidewalk. I was getting dizzy and couldn't get it to stop because it was going so fast. I hear Jem yelling behind me. All of a sudden, I bumped into something and stopped. I lay on the cement for a while and hear Jem's voice, Scout, get away from there, come on. I opened my eyes and realized I was at the front of the Radley's steps. Jem came to me and panicked. We both scurried out of there without the tire. Jem and I argued about who should go back to get the tire. Jem scowled and went back for it. He told me I was acting like a girl, and there was nothing to it. Calpurnia called us in for some lemonade. As we enjoyed our lemonade, Jem decided that we should play Boo Radley. What he meant was that we would play act using the Radleys as our characters. All throughout the summer, we perfected our act. We added dialogue and made it long. One day, when we were rehearsing one act, Atticus watched us. He told us that he hoped we were not uh, play-acting about the Radleys. Jem and I argued over whether or not we should continue acting this out since Atticus told us not to. So I'm going to stop here for a second just to remind you that I want us to focus on the conflict. It's summer. Both Scout and Jem have found these gifts in the, the, the tree by the Radley house, and now they're beginning to play act. They're making pretend they are the Radleys, and their father comes in and tells them not to do that. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Atticus as a father, the type of advice that he gives, as well as his parenting skills. We know that Atticus is a lawyer, and when Scout was really upset that she couldn't read uh, in school, Atticus came up with a, a plan, a compromise, and he asked her not to tell anybody that they would continue to read if she agreed to go to school. So he, he has a very good relationship with, uh, with his children, although we really don't see him being too mushy and lovey with them. Uh, here, Atticus gives them another piece of advice. He doesn't want them to, uh, to act out the rat. Take a look, then, at what happens. Atticus seeing us do this play acting for the fir was the first reason I wanted to stop doing this. The second reason had to do with what happened earlier that day. After I rolled into the Radley's yard, I heard not only Jim's voice yelling, but also another sound. 
It was a soft sound. Someone inside of the house was laughing. So this obviously scares Scout, and she realizes that the Radleys inside are watching what they're doing outside. So that kind of brings us to uh, the end of chapter four. Now I want us to take a look at the abridged version of chapter five. So I thought we should stop playing Boo Radley because Atticus had warned us not to. Jem said, we should just change the names of the characters and then nobody would know. Dill agreed. Dill, by the way, was being annoying. He had asked me earlier in the summer to marry him. Then he promptly forgot about it. He had said I was the only girl he would ever love, but then he ignored me. I beat him up twice, but it did no good. He kept becoming better friends with Jem. So this is, introduces one of the other conflicts in the story. There's obviously um, uh, a, a gender bias here, right? Dill and, and Jem feel that Scout is a girl, and so as they grow, as they mature, they kind of move away from her. Um, and that's going to be one of the, the important themes in the novel. I want us to think about this, though, as being prejudice. The boys are prejudiced towards the girls. And although Scout might not represent your typical girl, she plays a lot with the boys. She wants to beat uh, Dill up, just as she did with one of her other schoolmates. Um, it does present this, um, this division, right? We have the boys and we have the girls. So let's see what they continue to do. Since Dill and Jem were becoming so close, I was beginning to feel left out. So I spent some time becoming friendly with Miss Maudie Atkinson. Miss Maudie was a nice lady who lived across the street. She had always let us play in her yard, but we had never really been close to her. Now Maudie hated being indoors. She thought that time spent indoors was time wasted. She was a widow who worked in her garden wearing an old straw hat and men's overalls. She was pretty cool. She was honest, treated us with respect, and didn't like gossip. One day, I noticed that Miss Maudie was two, had two-minute gold prongs clipped to her, to her eye tooth. When I admired them and hoped I would have some eventually, she said, look here. With a click of her tongue, she thrust out her dentures. Cool. I think that was her way of letting me know that she really considered me a friend. Miss Maudie made the best cakes in the neighborhood. She would yell, Jem Finch, Scout Finch, Charles Barker Harris, come here. That meant that she had baked some small cakes for us and we went running. One evening I asked, Miss Maudie, do you think Boo Radley's still alive? His name's Arthur and he is alive, she said. How do you know? What a morbid question. I know he's alive, Jean Louise, because I haven't seen anyone carry out a body. Jen said that maybe he died and they stuffed him up in the chimney, I added. Miss Maudie said, Jem gets more like Jack Finch every day. They're both such wise guys. Jack Finch was my uncle, Atticus's brother, and Miss Maudie had known him since they were children. Miss Maudie had grown up near Finch's Landing and used to play with Jack. Uncle Jack visited our house every Christmas, and every Christmas he yelled across the street for Miss Maudie to come marry him. He was such a jokester. Miss Maudie would call back, Call a little louder, Jack Finch, and they'll hear you at the post office. Miss Maudie continued her answer about Boo Radley. Arthur Radley just stays in the house, that's all. Wouldn't you stay in the house if you didn't want to come out? Yes, ma'am, but I want to come out. Why doesn't he? Miss Maudie explained that Mr. Radley was a foot-washing Baptist, which means that he believes anything that's a pleasure is a sin. She said that some of those Baptists even passed by her house once and told her that she and her flowers were going to hell. They thought that Miss Maudie spent too much time outdoors and not enough time inside the house reading the Bible. So I'm going to highlight this here because it gives us some information about the Radleys. And obviously this is Miss Maudie's opinion, that they are foot-washing Baptists that consider anything that's a pleasure to be a sin. Take a look at what she says next. 
Miss Maudie said that these people were taking the Bible too literally. She said sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of uh, someone like your father. She also said that there were just some kind of men who who are so busy worrying about the next world that they've never learned to enjoy this one, like the Radleys. Miss Maudie said that all of the stories about Boo were gossip, from people like Stephanie Crawford, who were always in everybody's business. She said that she remembered Arthur as a really nice guy. So I'm going to highlight that because it's important as well. The next day I caught Jem and Dill planning something. They finally told me what it was. They were going to try to get a note to Boo Radley. They were going to put the note on the end of a fishing pole and stick it through the shutters. If someone came along the street, Dill would ring a bell to warn Jem. Dill explained what the note said. We're asking him, real politely, to come out sometimes and tell us what he does in there. We said we wouldn't hurt him and we'd buy him ice cream. I told Dill that he and Jem were crazy and that Boo would kill us. I was watching Jem try to get the note in the window when all of a sudden we heard Dill ringing his bell. I thought I would run around to see Boo Radley with bloody fangs. Instead, I saw Dill ringing the bell with all his might in Atticus's face. Uh-oh. So remember that they were not allowed to bother the Radleys. So when Atticus found out what we were trying to do, he told Jem to stop tormenting Arthur Radley. He continued on saying that Arthur did what Arthur did was his own business and not ours. If he wanted to come out, he would, and if he didn't, he had a right to stay inside without inquisitive children harassing him. He ended by saying that he did not want to see us playing the, the crazy game. He had seen us playing or make fun of anybody in on the street or in this town. Jim said, we weren't making fun of him. We were just, so that was what you were doing, wasn't it? You were acting out the Radley's life story, as I suspected, said Atticus accusingly. So remember that I asked you to think about Atticus's parenting skills and the type of advice that he gives. This is a really important point um, that I want to that I want to draw out in this story. So Atticus comes and he firmly says that he doesn't want his children harassing Arthur Radley. And before Jem had completely negated this, right? He said, we're not doing that. We're just, you're just playing a game. And then they decided to just change the name so nobody knew. But then Jem goes and he kind of falls for Atticus's trick. Atticus goes in very assuringly. You're playing this game, Boo Radley. And so Jem confesses. We weren't making fun of him. And now Atticus says, so that was what you were doing. So it says Jem got flustered and realized that Atticus had tricked him into admitting that the game they had been playing was really us acting out the gossip we had heard about the Radley family. When Atticus said, you want to be a lawyer, don't you? Jem realized that Atticus had used the oldest lawyer's trick on him. Atticus had pretended he knew we were playing Boo Radley when really he only suspected it. And then Jem confessed without realizing so I'm going to highlight this because it's important, right? We know that Atticus is a lawyer and he's kind of using some of those skills with his own children. So let's continue on and see what happens with, uh, with the children. So I'm going to move into chapter six, and this is the last one that we're going to do together. And here I want us to really figure out how far the kids are willing to go in their, you know, the mystery behind Boo Radley. So it says, on Dill's last night with us that summer, before he went back to Mississippi to start school, Dill noticed Mr. Avery on his front porch. Dill said, golly, look yonder. At first, we saw nothing, but then we saw an arc of water falling from the leaves and splashing into the yellow circle of the street light ten feet away. Dill said, Mrs. Avery must drink a gallon a day. So I realized that Mr. Avery was peeing off his porch. And then Dale and Jim argued over which one of them could pee further, and of course I felt left out again, being a girl and all. Later that night, Dale and Jim 
said they were going to peep in the Radley's window to see if they could get a look at Boo. They said that if I didn't want to go with them, I could go straight home and keep my mouth shut about it. I said, Jem, don't. Jem said, Scout, I'm telling you for the last time, shut your trap or go home. I declare to the Lord, you're getting more like a girl every day. So I shut up and joined them. So this is one of the themes, right? This prejudice against girls as Jem becomes older. We snuck under a barbed wire fence and through a creaky gate into the Radley yard. We had to be very quiet and I was so nervous. We gave Dill a boost up to look in the window, but he didn't see anything. So we went around back and Jem crept across the porch and peeked in a window. That was when I noticed the shadow. It was the shadow of a man with a hat on. It was moving towards Jem. The moonlight was bright enough to make shadows that night. Dill noticed it too, and then Jem. We were petrified. The shadow stopped about a foot beyond, beyond Jem. Its arm came out from its side, dropped, and was still. Then it turned and moved back across Jem, walked along the porch and off the side of the house, returning as it had come. We all made a run for it. We ran to the gate, and as we ran through the collards, I tripped. Then I heard the roar of a shotgun. We all scurried toward the barbed wire fence, but Jem got caught in it as he tried to get under. His pants were caught and he couldn't get them free, so he kicked his pants off and started running in his underwear. After resting for a minute, we realized that because of the shotgun noise, the whole neighborhood was standing around the Radley's front yard to see what was going on. We realized that we had better show up or else people might start to realize that it was us sneaking around in their yard. When we got there, we saw Mr. Nathan Radley, Boo's older brother, standing with a shotgun by his side. Atticus was there and Miss Maudie, Miss Stephanie Crawford, Miss Rachel, Dill's aunt, and Mr. Avery. What happened? asked Jim, as if he didn't know. Miss Maudie replied, Mrs. Radley says she shot at a, at a negro in his collared patch. That should be Mr. Radley. Did he hit him? No, said Miss Stephanie. Shot in the air. Scared him pale, though. Says if anybody sees a white nigger around, that's the one. Says he's got another bullet waiting for the next sound he, he hears in that patch. And next time, he won't aim high. Uh, be it dog, nigger, or chum finch. Miss Stephanie had noticed... Jem standing there without any pants on. Yes, ma'am? Asked Jem. Atticus spoke. Where are your pants, son? Dill spoke up quickly. He thought a good excuse, so nobody would suspect that it was really us in the Bradley's yard. He told everyone that he had won Jeb's pants from him in a game of strip poker. Jem and I relaxed, thinking that was a good excuse. But Miss Rachel, Dill's aunt, was very upset. She didn't think we should be playing poker. Gambling was a bad thing. But we said we were only betting with matches, not with real money. So they calmed down a little. Sure, matches were dangerous, but gambling was really dangerous. Kids shouldn't be gambling. It's kind of ironic that they're more concerned about us playing with cards than about us playing with matches. In the middle of the night, Jem had to sneak out to go back and get his pants, which were still stuck in the Radley's fence. If he didn't get his pants back, Atticus would know that Dill's strip poker excuse wasn't true. He didn't want Atticus to find out what he had done because he knew Atticus would be very disappointed in him. Jem said he shouldn't have, have gone to the Radley place like that. It was wrong. I was scared to let Jem go back there alone in the middle of the night, but he went anyway. After a while, he came back and crept into bed. Thank goodness. So that brings us to the end of the abridged version of chapter six. So we read chapter four, five, and six. And again, I wanted us to think about the conflict that ensues throughout these, uh, these chapters. What you're going to be doing on your own is reading the complete version of chapter uh, chapter 7, and then you're going to read the abridged versions of chapter 8 and 9. 
all of this I have for you in the lesson folder for today. Before I let you go, I just want to kind of recap some of the things that have been um, going on in, uh, in the story. So I have this pulled up here. So obviously in chapter four, we saw that Boo Radley um, is still a mystery, is a mystery. To the kids. So Jem, Dale, and Scout play the make believe game who Bradley we know that Scout and Jem find several gifts in the tree by the Radley And one of the conflicts here Jem and Dill see Scout as a girl. Okay. So again there's this this prejudice against uh, against that idea of the girls. And the other thing that we spoke about is Atticus. Parenting style, his advice, so one of the most important um, quotes of the story happened in chapter 3 when Atticus said, you never really understand a person until you consider things from the or from his point of view and this is from chapter three and this quote here is important because the kids scout gem and dill play pretend because they are interested in the mystery of Boo Radley, but they do not consider how this would make Boo feel. The point of view here is very important, and so as the story progresses, we're going to see how the kids, Scout, Gem, and Dill, try and learn to consider things from other people's point of view. At this point in the story, we're just getting the perspective of Scout, who is looking back at this um, as, a, as an adult. So I'm going to leave you here. Um, I want you to ask me any questions if you do have any. And like I said, I'm hoping that we can do a live conference together on Monday, 1230, so that I can discuss some of these things with you.